Hey everyone, welcome back to Bear It In Mind. This video is going to cover ways to evaluate humanistic psychology that is going to include how Maslow's hierarchy of need has shaped businesses around the world, how humanistic psychology might be criticised for being culturally biased, as well as whether we even have free will. But first, let's critically discuss the research behind all of Abraham Maslow and Carl Rogers' ideas. In discussing the research methods used by humanistic psychology, we are referring to the way they investigate and study human behaviour. In contrast to many of the other approaches covered in this series, who often adopt scientific methods such as lab experiments, humanistic psychology takes a different path. They often use qualitative research methods that include case studies, diary accounts, open-ended questionnaires and unstructured interviews. For example, you may remember from our last video how Abraham Maslow based his ideas of self-actualization on his research of individual historical figures. And Carl Rogers' work on the self is heavily based on his unstructured interviews with his clients. One reason for this is because humanistic psychology places a strong emphasis on a person's unique subjective experiences and that this is of greater importance when it comes to understanding a person than the scientific principle of being objective. We can see this in humanistic psychology with terms such as self-actualization which are highly subjective, difficult to define and are very difficult to study objectively. In Rogers' own words, experience is for me the highest authority, the touchstone of validity is my own experience. No other person's ideas and none of my own ideas are as authoritative as my experience. So in terms of evaluation, on the one hand, humanistic psychology can be praised for the research methods they use to study human behaviour. This is because the use of such qualitative methods, like unstructured interviews, are useful for the detailed study of an individual. It allows them to really understand a person and gain more insight into the richness of human behaviour than typical lab-based experiments. For example, consider how in a lab-based study into memory, they might gather quantitative data in terms of a numerical figure, such as how many words you remembered from a list. Whereas the humanistic method would be more considered with gathering qualitative data in the form of interviews concerned with your experiences of certain memories and how it made you feel and why that memory might have meaning to you. Therefore, it could be argued that the humanistic approach gives a more valid insight into human behaviour because their research methods value the subjective experience of people. However, these research methods used by humanistic psychology have been criticised for being unscientific. As we've discussed before with the evaluation of the psychodynamic approach, one of the key features of the scientific process is what Karl Popper referred to as falsifiability. This is the idea that in order for a theory to be scientific, it has to have the possibility of being shown to be false or being shown to be incorrect. Science doesn't try to go around trying to simply find evidence for theories, but to try to find evidence that disproves the theories. For example, Karl Popper used the famous example of swans. If your theory is that all swans are white, you don't go around looking for white swans to confirm or prove your theory. You go around looking for swans that are grey or black. You're trying to disprove it. And if you never find any grey or black swans, then perhaps your white swan theory gains strength. Humanistic psychology, however, is argued to be unfalsifiable. This is because many of the ideas and concepts of humanistic psychology are subjective and difficult to test. In order to test and measure something, it needs to be clearly defined, what we call operationalised. Concepts like self-actualization and congruence are rather vague and difficult to define, which therefore makes it untestable in any scientific way. This contrasts with the highly scientific methodology of the behaviourist approach, with the falsifiable research of B.F. Skinner, and the biological approach's investigation of the human brain through brain scanning technology. Therefore, it could be argued that humanistic psychology is undermined in its explanation of human behaviour because of the lack of scientific evidence. Next, let's consider how we can use the debate to discuss humanistic psychology. 
One of the ways humanistic psychology has been praised is because of its emphasis on free will. This is in contrast to many other approaches in psychology who have been criticised for being deterministic, such as the behaviourist approach who see our behaviour as caused by external environmental factors in terms of how our behaviour is conditioned, or the biological approach who see our behaviour as being caused by the genetic makeup in our DNA or the specific brain structures and chemicals in our brain. Humanistic psychology emphasis on free will is a more optimistic view of human behaviour where they see each person as active agents, able to make choices that can shape their futures, not helpless slaves to their past or their biology. This is seen in their focus on personal growth and in how client or person-centred therapy sees the person choosing and discovering their own solution to their own problems. Therefore, it could be argued that humanistic psychology has value for offering an alternative positive view of human behaviour in contrast to the often negative aspects of the other approaches who focus on determinism. Let's consider how we can use another debate to discuss humanistic psychology, this time the holism versus reductionism debate. The holism and reductionism debate is about what is the best way to explain behaviour. To what extent should we explain behaviour by reducing or breaking down behaviour to its simplest component parts? Or should we explain human behaviour as a whole? One of the main strengths of the humanistic psychology is that it's holistic. This is in contrast once again to many of the other approaches in psychology who have been criticised for being reductionist, such as the behaviourist approach, who break human behaviour down to simple stimulus and response associations, or the biological approach, which breaks human behaviour down to neurotransmitter levels, for example, or even the cognitive approach, who have been criticised for breaking human behaviour down to the processes of a machine. Humanistic psychology, on the other hand, sees human beings as being more than the sum of their parts, and therefore argue that to break human behaviour down to a single component part means you lose what it means to be human. You lose the richness and the meaning behind behaviour that comes from exploring it within its real life context. For example, reducing depression down to simply an imbalance of neurochemicals loses the real life context in which the depression is being experienced. In contrast, humanistic psychology would be much more interested in exploring perhaps how the depression has developed in the context of a troubled childhood, in particular the way their parents behave towards them, and perhaps they have difficulties forming and maintaining relationships as a result, and perhaps they're struggling to find work that is enjoyable and valued by others, and so lack meaning and purpose in what they do. Therefore, it could be argued that humanistic psychology offers a more valid explanation because of their holistic approach to explaining human behaviour. One of the main strengths of the humanistic approach is seen in its real-world application. Firstly, one practical application of humanistic psychology is seen in counselling therapy. This is because the work of Carl Rogers, with his client or person-centred therapy, helped forward a new type of therapy that has gone on to influence the counselling that is conducted in areas such as schools, social work, as well as in more formal clinical settings. This therapy put the focus on a person's present problems, as opposed to dwelling on the past, like Freud's psychotherapies, taking a more positive approach in terms of guiding the person to go on a journey of self-discovery to help them grow as opposed to relying on an expert to fix them. It works best with conditions like anxiety and low self-esteem as opposed to more severe conditions like schizophrenia. For more information on how this therapy works, check out the previous video on the humanistic approach where we explored person-centred therapy in more detail. For another practical application, Maslow's hierarchy of need has helped inform businesses with their understanding of the needs of their employees and then how best to motivate them so they are able to do their best work. For example, an employee needs their lower needs to be met first, such as their basic needs where they need money for food and somewhere to live, and their safety needs such as a safe working environment and long-term job security as well as with their pension. Then in order for them to progress and produce good work, they need to feel like they belong to the company and that they are socially accepted. 
they then want to feel like their work is making a significant contribution and that the work they produce is valued. Perhaps their hard work is recognised with the appropriate job title or a promotion. When an employee feels these needs are being met, they are then in a position to produce their most excellent work for the company, where they can strive to be the best they can be. Therefore, it could be argued that humanistic psychology has made a significant contribution because of how it can help businesses and employees be more successful and effective in their work. Finally, we can also evaluate humanistic psychology in relation to the issues covered in the A-level psychology course, specifically the issue of cultural bias. Before we dive into the specifics, however, it's important for you to be aware of the difference between what is referred to as individualistic cultures and collectivist cultures. Individualistic cultures are where the focus is on the individual self and expressing individuality rather than the group, the family or society. The individual is most important and a higher priority than the group. Individualistic cultures are often seen in westernised cultures like the USA and the United Kingdom. Collectivist cultures, on the other hand, have the focus on the group identity, on the family or society. The group is most important and a higher priority than the individual. Collectivist cultures are often seen in Eastern cultures like China and India. Now these are obviously very generalised ways of viewing these different cultures, but they're a helpful distinction for you to understand. One major limitation of the humanistic approach is that it's culturally biased. This is because the concepts of self-actualization and self-esteem, for example, are a product of Western society and cannot be applied to all cultures. In collectivist cultures such as China, the achievement of a group of people may be valued more highly than the achievement of an individual and terms such as self-esteem are just not applicable. For example, a literature review conducted by Gambrel and Chan Chi in 2003 investigated how well Maslow's hierarchy of need applied to business and management in China. Maslow's theory was obviously developed in the US and applied to US westernized businesses, so would this theory of motivation work as well in a completely different culture? They concluded that in a collectivist culture, the basic need is belonging, and the needs of self-esteem were just eliminated, they weren't relevant, and the process of self-actualization was achieved through a completely different set of needs, needs that focused on social development. In other words, the focus was on the collective, the group, the company, as opposed to an individual's growth. Therefore, it could be argued humanistic psychology can be criticised for being ethnocentric, which means it's centred or based on one particular culture, that of a westernised individualistic American culture, and therefore limited in terms of how far it could be applied to other cultures. Now, it's not enough for you to simply know about humanistic psychology, or even to be able to evaluate it, or even to know about all of the other approaches we've covered in this series. In the A-level psychology course, a specific requirement is for you to be able to compare each of the approaches. So if you want to master that content, check out this next video that's on the screen that shows you a variety of ways to do just that. And for more on any of the other approaches in psychology, check the link to the playlist in the description below or on the screen now. I hope you found this video helpful and we'll see you in the next one.